Wow, everything's working. We all wow. seem to be here. What happened to the intro? What happened to the intro? We just saw the intro. Oh, wait. I thought there was an intro to this. No, I didn't do any further intro. There was an intro to everybody who was hanging out. They got to see a preview. Oh, oh all what day. kind of an intro is that? I thought you were going to put something oh, here. Oh, okay. look at this. Look at this. This is slave driving. He's slave driving me. Put <laughs> Welcome, Max. Effort. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, great to be here. Welcome to two brothers feuding nonstop trying to get the truth out. <laughs> Or, or something like that. Or something like that. All right. Yeah. We don't normally have a guest unless it's a Barnes, but Barnes isn't a guest. Barnes right. is a force. Um, today we have Max Good, who has put together a fantastic film on Ruth Payne. And I mean, as much as Mark has read on it, I completely um, rely on Mark's opinion. I enjoyed it very much, but to have the veracity agreed upon by Mark is something truly astounding. Um, yeah, Max, I, I got to tell you, it hit every single beat of my own personal take on the pains, which is astounding how similar the takes were. I, I've never met you. We're going to do some magic tricks here. You've just come up out of the audience. We have no relationship. I just want to tell the audience. But I was astounded as to how similar our takes were. Let me just put it that way. And I love the film. Really great movie, bro. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I I thought it was important to uh, to explore all these suspicions ar around the pains and uh, not uh, you know play them down uh, and actually get Ruth's response uh, <laughs> to some of these this stuff directly. Uh, it was it was a little uncomfortable at times, but uh, I had to do it. Right. <laughs> well, we've got an old favorite in the audience here, Ken. No, the film is just about identical to everything Mark said. <laughs> Have a yeah, nice day. In fact, in <laughs> fact, at the end, when you put up uh, the book uh, JFK and the Unspeakable by Douglas, I had a laugh because it's you know, one of my favorites. That was a nice little tribute there at the end, Max. Yeah, well, that reading that book was, was how I first became familiar with the pains. Right. And I, I had never really heard of them before, so... It was a shock to to hear this on top of everything else, and I didn't really know what to think. Uh, you know, could this all this stuff be true? Who knows? So, uh, Let's go backwards for a second. How did you get started in this? Were you going to Stanford? I I, I know a little bit, but maybe you can explain uh, how you got this far in terms of the project. How did you get started? So after after I learned about the pains from reading that book, I I always thought this would be a great subject. For a documentary, and then I I heard that Ruth Payne actually lived not far from me, about an, an hour away, uh, up in Santa Rosa. And yes, I was going to grad school for documentary um, about ten years ago, and this was one of the ideas on on my list of possible films. And uh, I reached out to her uh through email and you know she was very very open and we started talking and you know uh she agreed to do it and uh i first made a 20 minute film back then that was finished right. in uh 2015 and i just knew this this had to be a feature length film there, there was too much uh information to pack into a short and uh, so I, I kept doing more interviews. I interviewed her after that, lots more people. And it uh, took me seven years total. <laughs> wow. And this, this film, film is finally done. Wow. So how I mean, was, did, you, did you get, I'm sorry, did you get uh, aid from every member of your family or did you find money in other traditional uh, documentary film uh, uh, corners? Yeah, I, I did a Kickstarter back in 2017 and Right yes, uh, my family donated some money, uh, <laughs> and yeah, I, I basically just did it all on on my own dime for the most part. Besides that, uh, by work working freelance, uh, mostly as as a video editor and other roles in the in the documentary industry. Um, so, 
yeah, it, it took so long, partly because I had very little funding and I had to do right. almost everything myself. W were you afraid that people were going to die by the, before you finished it? Yeah, I knew that was a real issue. I, I mean, I, I interviewed people who were in their late 80s and 90s, you know, so and some people did die. <laughs> Uh, Michael Payne died in sure. 2018. Right. Priscilla Johnson McMillan died wow, while while that. this film while this film was being uh, edited, um, and Vince Salandria died. So. Oh right, right. I saw the little tribute there at the end. Yeah. Yeah, three three people that I know of. It's interesting. Three, about eight, eight or ten years ago, I called up Patricia McMillan. And she answered the phone and I said, are you still alive? And she said, yes, I'm still alive. And that was the beginning of the conversation. Yeah. But she's apparently, really, obviously passed on, but. Really interesting character. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I right. love your your question to her um, about what was that? Um, not credible. I, you said something about how she was, uh, she would go along with whatever they said. I forgot the term you used. And she yeah. Kept, kept trying to um twist the word to the other um mark help me out what word was that I, um was witting. Witting, or unwitting. witting witting that's right witting, witting. right witting which witting. i thought was so funny because you're like it said witting and she goes unwitting i don't know if i'm unwitting you're like no witting it, it said witting right <laughs> it was Max, it's well. amazing how they all have the same tonality and manipulation of words and that includes uh Matt holland her and Ruth Payne, they all take your questions and slightly twist it around, you know, which comes out in the film that I notice how similar they are. Yeah, uh, you know, they're they're all very intelligent people and and sometimes almost lawyerly in the way mm -hmm. they speak. Uh, right. you, you might notice, you know, some interesting phrasing that some of these people use. Well, I loved how you showed her over the years at every anniversary, Ruth Payne. I mean, th this chick should have won the Academy Award for acting, I think. I, I, everybody said she's a you know bad actor, a bad liar. I tend to disagree. No. She stuck to her notes for 50 years in every single show under bright lights. And that part where you showed her, you know, saying the same thing over and over again was so powerful, Max, to, you know, to see that, how this woman stuck to the script. She wasn't chosen by accident. I mean, this woman was skillful. Yeah, well, there there are two ways to look at that, uh, just like everything in the film. Uh, you know, you can say that she's given so many interviews and she has to tell this story over and over again. Sure. So it, it becomes uh, kind of a standard standard retelling that she gives, you know, that, uh, or you can say she's she's sticking to a, a script that somebody told her uh, to stick to um, really depends on your perspective. And I, I just want to remind people that it was important for me to, to be ob objective in this. I, I went into this with an open mind. I, I, I didn't know if, if Ruth is, I was going to end up thinking Ruth is, is lying or she's totally innocent. And I, it was important for me to to let the audience also come to their own conclusions. So I I let Ru Ruth speak and respond to a lot of these accusations and interview people like Gerald Posner and Priscilla Johnson McMillan, Max Holland, alongside all the the, the researchers and people from the conspiracy side. And uh, I want people to uh, think critically and and decide for themselves uh, where they stand. How did you leave it? How did I leave it? What do you What do you mean? Well, you went in. You said yeah. you're neutral. Mm -hmm. How did you come out? Still completely undecided and neutral. No personal yeah. opinions either way. Well, I'm publicly. I'm. I'm. I'm not uh, <laughs> going okay. to share exactly what my okay. my opinions are. Right. Um, I. I do. You know. I. I came out on a. On a particular side. Uh, but I don't know if it's if it's that helpful for for viewers of the audience to know what side I came out on. Um, I think it's yeah, it's more important for them to to uh, decide for themselves and, and uh, think critically. What surprised you? Um, 
I surprised that Ruth keeps on doing interviews and and talking about this. I, I mean, she was still doing interviews in 2019. Uh, she went out to Dallas and did some big uh, interviews with the Sixth Floor Museum and uh, a talk in her old hometown, Irving, Texas. Um, and I've even heard that she has plans to go to Dallas for the 60th anniversary hmm. in 2023. Uh, she'll be uh, 91. 91, yeah. And that might so, well be the last anniversary she could attend. I mean, I, who knows? I mean, she, she's up there in years. And she, now, looked very, she looked very healthy, though, didn't she, Eric? She looked like she was together. I mean, oh, she's sharp, sharp as a tack. And what yeah. I wanted to say is that I don't know if the representation came across exactly. Um, when we're talking about she's incredibly well spoken and eloquent, that's not necessarily saying that she's repeating the same story. It is saying she's very well spoken and eloquent and presents herself in a, a great manner. There's not much hesitation, no ums, very good presentation. Throughout all these interviews, she seems very sharp as a tack, would be the best way I can put it. Yeah, she's she's very articulate, very intelligent. Um, and it's you can't fluster her very easily. I mean, she she took some of those extremely uncomfortable questions <laughs> I gave gave her and barely ever showed any annoyance even. Uh, so she's, yes, she is extremely sharp and I have a lot of respect <laughs> for her, um, you know, and she's she must be extremely strong to have lived with this for almost 60 years and uh, had to tell this story and know, know that people suspect her of all kinds of nefarious stuff. Well, let's get into what she's lived with for 60 years. Um, you Did you explore her papers at Antioch at all, Max, or? Um, her papers, if they're, they're the same ones that you're talking about, her papers are stored at Swarthmore Oh, College Swarthmore, I'm sorry. In, Take in that back, Swarthmore, yeah. yeah. And I, I went there in person and, okay. and looked at those papers uh, some of the papers there are, include uh, the this letter, this draft of this letter that Oswald allegedly wrote to the Soviet embassy that she mm. essentially stole from him a, a draft of it that he he was writing in her house on but her let's typewriter. Just, let's just interrupt yeah. for a second. This is a typewritten letter, not a handwritten letter by Lee Harvey Oswald, right? The original was handwritten. Okay. He, he hand wrote a draft. Right. And then typed typed out a version from that draft. Right. And now there are several versions of that letter in her papers uh, at Swarthmore. Um, her old her her date book from 1963 is there. So I yeah, I went and held this stuff, scanned it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing that you can can access that stuff. Right. So now, this this I mean, she obviously was able to write Russian and spoke Russian. And there's been allegations that she wrote these letters, that she wrote the Walker letter, that she put the Walker letter in the cookbook to give to Marina. How did you address that or did you not address it or did you discard that or what were your suspicions? Um, I, I didn't ever bring up an accusation like that, of, you know, accusing her of of forging something directly uh right i hadn't i hadn't read much about that uh i think you know people people maybe shy away from from making uh an accusation that strong okay but uh, uh it's you know I, i've seen you know people do wonder if if she she might have uh might have written this stuff. Uh, it is, you know, if she did know Russian, yeah, it's it's possible. Okay, so when when Buddy Walters and the Dallas police come to her house and take everything out of there, and they take her projector and the films that are described as lesbian films, they go to Michael Payne and they ask him about the films. He denies they're his. She fought 
tenaciously to get the projector and the films back, plus the letters to Marina that she wrote that a lot of people have construed to be love letters. Did you read the letters that, that she wrote to Marina before and after the assassination? And if you did, how did you interpret them? I only read a little bit of those letters. I, I did not read all of them. You okay. might be more knowledgeable on some of this stuff than I am. I've, I've heard the lesbian accusations. Uh, I think that's in in one one book, uh, but uh, I, I never really followed up with that. Uh, A.J. Weberman, a researcher, was telling me that about these lesbian films that were found. But, right. uh, you know, that's the kind of thing, who, who knows? And it's it's kind of a sensational, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's hard to pin down, you know, is that wh where, where was that reported or is it, is it accurate? Well, I mean, we do know that she invites her to live with her after barely knowing her, uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, we do know that Michael Payne leaves, they never get back together, but yet they're together throughout their entire lives. I mean, they have the two children and yet he seems to be in her orbit her entire life, even in your film at the end in the nursing home. Uh, uh, right, Max? I mean, why would a divorced husband be in that peripheral world of the divorced wife for, for 60 years? Um, I think they said that they they remained friendly even after separating, you know. Uh, these are pretty, pretty uh, liberal, sort of enlightened people. And uh, I think that's that's the reasoning. Ruth did have a boyfriend. I'll, I'll tell you this. She had a ah. boyfriend. You can see him in the movie. Right. I he, saw that guy. Yeah. Who was a, that? The guy she's picking, picking fruit with. Right. Uh, mm. That was her boyfriend at the time that I was interviewing him. And he would uh, sometimes sit in on the interviews. Uh, he also passed away the same year Michael Payne passed away. Right. Interesting. Did she get into, or did you get into anything about her, um, activity in Central America during the uh, Sandinista uh, Contra squabble that was going on down there and how she was asked to leave the country by the people who were down there as outed as a CIA operative to her face, apparently, according to uh, the even I think even the woman who's in your film, right? Or Yeah. Uh, so I interviewed a woman named Sue Wheaton, who was down there in Nicaragua yeah. and w witnessed uh, some of this um with with ruth actually being accused of being a, a a cia asset or an agent by the uh the people who were helping the sandinistas and the, the poor people in nicaragua for this um this quaker peace organization pro nica uh so you know i from what i understand people were suspicious of her before they even knew about her connection to the assassination that's that's what mm. i understand from uh, one of the sources in the film i understood that to be true too from other yeah. sources yeah. and then sue wheaton brought up her connection with the assassination and then people thought oh wow this this is even more suspicious and she was uh ruth was even sort of kicked out of one of these groups and asked to, to leave they sent her away to go you know go get some r and r at the beach or something so she wasn't directly involved with this group right you think promica was a front for the cia it was a legitimate quaker group or i mean my my research has always indicated both the quakers and the jesuits have been used as uh, intelligence fronts during the cold war many times yeah i, I read a book about uh, the CIA's use of religious groups. It's called A Certain Arrogance. Oh, by, yeah. By, by Professor uh, George Michael Avika. Avika's book, yeah. Great That's, book. So, yeah, there is, you know, an established history of the CIA, Alan Dulles, using some people like that. Um, I, Pronika, I did some research into them. I was, I was talking to people in Florida who were part of that group. Um, and... I was getting even talked to somebody in Nicaragua um, and I could never get a straight answer, but I did talk to somebody who, who thought the group, uh, the bigger group might be suspect that, that some right. of the projects that they said they were doing, mm -hmm. they actually weren't doing. Uh, right. That's I, what I, I was never able to confirm that, 
but I did speak to somebody who who told me that. Wow. Now, let, I mean, just, let me just ask you about the uh, the Minox camera because that is a big deal. The camera itself, you know, the finding of the um, in Oswald Seabag of the Minox spy camera, uh, and then also later Michael Payne claiming that he had a Minox spy camera, which leads to two of these Minox spy cameras. That's a photo of the one that I own. Um, made in West Germany. And there's film on these cameras. And the film, uh, there's two different serial numbers, two different cameras. Michael Payne says his was in a coffee can in the garage, that it had fallen into salt water in the ocean, was damaged. Uh, the original one is seized by Gus Rose, Detective Gus Rose, later of the Thin Blue Line. But the original one, uh, seized by Gus Rose from Dallas PD, is on the evidence list and the FBI and him get into a, 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 a fight to try to remove it from the evidence list. And this leads to, that's the, uh, yeah, that's my set that I have here. Um, but yeah, that's the actual photo from the evidence uh, room there in Dallas police headquarters. But my question is this, Michael Payne, why would Michael Payne have a Minox camera? He claims to have gone to these right wing uh, uh, rallies with Oswald that he said Oswald told him he was spying on these right wing groups. Payne seems to have his own take on it. Uh, did you get anything out of Michael when you spoke to him or was he too far gone, Max? Yeah, I, I didn't get much out of Michael. I, I only had, a, you know, about half an hour to talk to him. Um, it was uh, just a spur of the moment little interview and he was he was already losing his his memory. Right. So I, I never got another chance to talk to him. The the whole Minox camera thing is so convoluted and yeah. complicated that I, I left it out of the movie. Um, right, I noticed that. That's why I brought it up here, yeah. because it, it is a convoluted situation, without a doubt. I mean, the photos yeah. on there are of military installations in Central, in Central America. And there are, you know, horse and buggies. It's clearly Central American countries. Uh, where Oswald never was, but Michael Payne was. So, uh, I, and there's a pussycat in there, which may or may not have been the Payne's pussycat that seems to disappear because the kids are allergic to cats. So the pussycat disappears, which becomes Pussygate um, regarding uh, some of the films that, that some of the developed footage that's on the cameras. Yeah. I, I hope your audience appreciates going into the weeds this far. Um, oh, they do. Oh, yeah. That's why they're here. <laughs> this is this is why they're here. Yeah. This okay. So, here. the the Minox camera. I I agree with you. It's suspicious whether it's Oswald's or Michael's, which or is both. The, or both. Yeah, the, the the official line now is that it was Michael's. Right. Well, that's why. What is Michael Payne doing with the spy camera then? Right. Um, I've also seen a picture that that looks a lot like Oswald that is supposed to be. Uh, came came from the Minox, so right. Um, who knows? But there's a lot of controversy over this. You people, you can find people arguing back and forth that it was, you know, it was Oswald's or it was Michael's, like like the the authorities say. Um, either way, it's suspicious, and you know, it's what you can you can take the police officer's word for it and the police report that has has the camera on it. Well, it also has uh, a photo of the camera, so it's more than the, a police report. The photo is is controversial. It's it's hard to see. <laughs> there's there's controversy over whether it's a light meter or the camera, and the the police were confused and mistook a light meter for the camera. Well, Rose says he wasn't confused, so there's yeah. there seems to be a lot of pushback on there. That's the the, the light meter there, but the the one of the photos that's on the camera is of a guy named Jerry Patrick Hemming. And I think uh, Eric may have a picture of Jerry who is, um, you know, he's he's in the he's in the film that's developed. There's a picture of Jerry. Um, now, Jerry's an interesting character because he goes down and becomes friends with a certain Cuban uh, dictator. Um, there's some more shots of Jerry Patrick. Yeah, there's there's a shot of him with Castro I don't know if you have that. There it is. Yeah, that's uh, early. <coughs> no, that's Frank Sturgis with Gaston. Oh, Frank Sturgis is going to come up, who's also uh, featured as Hemming's best friend. Um, yeah. This is an interesting development that that Hemming is there because he served. Oh, he's a Marine, too. 
Well, not only is he a Marine, he served in El Toro, California with Oswald in 1959 and leaves in 59 to go fight with the rebels in, in the mountains of uh, Cuba. Same thing Oswald said he was going to do. Hemming actually does it. And he goes down, he fights with them. I don't know how he ends up on the film footage from the Minox, but apparently he does, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, Hemming becomes best friends with a guy named uh, Frank Fiorini, um, who changes his name to Frank Sturgis. And Frank Sturgis is this apparently- This is my favorite shot. Oh, that's on the that's on a mass grave, actually. I think. Yeah, with Batista um, supporters that were executed. Right, right. That's a weird, weird photo of, of yeah, yeah. He was an interesting guy. But Sturgis, um, who was Frank Fiorino, born in Virginia in 1929, he changes his name to Frank Sturgis, and it's a take on a character in a book that was written in 1949 named Hank Sturgis. And Hank Sturgis was the uh, protagonist in a book written by a guy named uh, E. Howard Hunt. <laughs> you can't make this up, Eric. You can't make this up. Max, before we go too far down this, yeah. one thing I found, because I listen to Mark all the time, so I, I'm just like hit with a fire hose. <clears throat> but what I'm finding is character after character after character who were involved, you'll hear the basic line of, oh, they were just a businessman and they did such and such. But then as you dig into them, they have this giant rich history, like uh, George DeMorschelt. I don't know if I said his name right. You did a lot on him. They kind of represented him as, oh, yeah, he was just some immigrant dude and businessman. International, nothing, nothing there. But there's all kinds of stuff that seem to be there about him, tying him with um, uh, Jackie, you know, later to be Jackie Kennedy and everything else. Did you find that in your research that all the minor characters seem to have a whole lot more of a tapestry around them? Yes, for sure. Uh, DeMorin Schilt is one of my favorite characters. I think everybody should know about George DeMorin Schilt. Uh, you know, he he's he's confirmed as as some CIA asset. asset. They, they called him a uh, unpaid informants in in a memo and you know he's he's got this strange history he's he's connected to the the cia station you know chief in uh in dallas j walton moore he's friend on friendly terms you know has dinner with him um yeah he knew he knew jackie kennedy's family he knew, knew george bush's family um and he he even wrote this book, you know, some some of the stuff that George DeMorenschild says, we're not sure if you can trust it all, but uh, he wrote a book called I, I Am a Patsy about telling his his story of his uh, relationship with Oswald. And then, of course, DeMorenschild, uh, when the, the HSC CA goes to interview him in, you know, the, the, the late 70s, he he either commits suicide or he's murdered uh the, the same day <laughs> they they came to uh to his house to to ask for an interview and uh, spoke to his daughter you know later that day he ends up dead well i mean there, in 1966 as i was i was telling eric apparently in the, before the grand jury the secret grand jury uh, ha, uh jim garrison interviews ruth payne and says to her, uh, did she ever meet Jamor and Schilt ever again after the handling or the handoff or whatever you want to talk about, you know, George Jamor and Schilt does and then goes off to Haiti. And Ruth Payne tells Jim Garrison, according to Jim Garrison in his book, that uh, she said in 1966 they had dinner together three years after the assassination uh, and that Jamor and Schilt was showing him the new photo that he had found um, of uh, Oswald with the rifle and the communist newspapers and the handgun. Did you uh, look into that at all or? Yeah, I know about that. There's okay. that she met with, with DeMorin Schilt at, at a later date. And there's this issue with uh, one of the backyard photos or some new version of the backyard photos being found in a storage unit. Yeah. Um, and Ruth Payne having some 
involvement with with those belongings. Uh, she, yeah, when I asked her about Demorne Schultz, I th she says she only met him once in the in the that's film. That's why I'm that's why I'm asking yeah, which, you. Yeah, which is uh, contradictory <laughs> to to what we know. Um, Under oath. Maybe she maybe she forgot. Maybe she. Uh, you know, <laughs> this woman doesn't forget that anything. One, uh, yeah. That woman forgot. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but this she might have. She might have phrased it as, "I think I only met with him once." Or right, something, right. You know? Another character that um, Mark and I are especially fascinated in, uh, more and more lately, is uh, General Walker, and yeah. I mean, we've literally done two episodes on him. He was somebody who just like, oh my god so much came out about him. Have you looked into it? I know he came up in the film and stuff, but what, what are your thoughts about him and his ties with the story? I feel like there could be more there. Yeah. Ruth Payne is, is intimately tied in with, with the oh, yeah. Walker story yeah. because she handed over this book. It's a, some book of Marina's of uh, child rearing advice or something in Russian that I guess the authorities didn't take away when they when they searched uh, the house and, and took all kinds of stuff. She hands this over, you know, a, a week or so after the assassination um, to the Secret Service, uh, FBI or something to give give to Marina. And then they say they find this note in the book uh, and they, they come back to, to Ruth and ask her, did you write this note? Do you know whose handwriting it is? Do you know anything about this? And and she says no. Um, so this this note becomes a an extremely important piece of evidence that that's used to tie Oswald to the Walker shooting, and that's so important because it's uh, it's a way to demonstrate a, a precedent for him being capable of. Uh, trying to kill somebody or assassinate somebody. Uh, it should be interjected that his fingerprints were not on the letter, nor has that uh, the writing been confirmed to be Oswald's. But I'm sorry, go on. Yeah, uh, the, from what I understand, yeah, the, not, there were fingerprints found on the letter and none of them matched anybody. Marina, right. Marina or, right. or, or Ruth. Lee. Ruth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Ruth. I, I don't know if, if they checked for Ruth, but... Uh, um, Oh, that's so, a good question. Yeah, I don't know if they checked yeah. for Ruth. Yeah. And then there are other issues with the Walker shooting with, with the, you know, the witnesses who were there. And, and uh, there's a lot of, lot of doubt you could, you could throw on, on the yeah, idea. The Walker that, things of Pandora's box by itself, Max, you know what I mean? Like he calls up the newspaper in Munich after the day after the assassination and says that Oswald shot at him. The uh, Munich newspapers then run that story and that's kind of where it spreads from uh his own his own telephone call walker yeah so if you look in the warren warren report there's a nice section where they talk about the walker shooting it's it's very important for their narrative you know mm -hmm. it's in the the quote is thereby demonstrating oswald's you know tendency to 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 take a human life or something. Uh, so. Well, he misses a 30 yard chip shot with a sitting guy having a cup of coffee through a lit window, but he's able to hit a moving car with two or three shots from the sixth floor of a building. Kind of an erratic shooter if you want to uh, judge his, uh, his skills. Yeah, and Ruth Payne and uh, Priscilla Johnson McMillan like to call the Walker shooting the Rosetta Stone uh, of the yes. assassination. So for yes. them, it's, this is central to right. the entire case right um and if you ever talk to ruth the first thing she'll bring up is the walker shooting and yes. ask, ask if if you know about it what do you think about it mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of her, her test to see well is that hmm. because the tippet shooting fell apart um i, I I, I don't know. I mean, the, the typical Because shooting... there were people who said that was the Rosetta Stone at the beginning, that he killed a cop, and that was the reason that he killed the president. The Walker thing surplants it later, I think. You know, but originally it's Tippett that's the Rosetta Stone. Yeah, now now you'll hear people say that Tippett and Walker, you know, together obviously demonstrate that 
Oswald killed the president. I mean, right, he, right. he killed a police officer on the day. Mm -hmm. He he tried to shoot this this general months before. I mean, mm -hmm. what other question could you have? I think you brought that up in the film too, though, that there's kind of some confusing aspects of of Walker hated Kennedy because he saw him as a pinko communist. Um, Oswald was acting like he was a communist. So why is he hanging out with a right winger? Oh, wait, he wants to kill. It, it, it's like all the political alignments seem sort of befuddling. Yeah. Yeah. The, the political motivation doesn't make any sense at all. No, that, it's a mess. Oswald, at first, you, you think he's a communist. Okay, maybe he's going to try to kill Walker, who's this right wing fanatic segregationist guy. Uh, and he's going to be be a hero or stop some, you know, rising fascist leader, uh, a la Hitler. Hitler, uh, yeah, they mentioned Hitler, yeah, yeah. Um, and then he he turns around and supposedly kills JFK, who's who's the, you know, uh, diametrically opposed to to Walker, and they're you know Walker's a, a an arch enemy of, of the Kennedys, so, uh, you know. The reasoning there, you, you might have to say Oswald just wanted to kill somebody to get famous or something. But if you accept he didn't, he wouldn't take credit for the fame that he was was grabbing at. Like every other killer who claimed fame as their motivation, he refused to admit it. Yeah, if if you ascribe any sort of logic to Oswald, it doesn't make any sense that he would he would try to kill Walker and then ki kill Kennedy. What about the getting back to Michael Payne? What do you think the politics of Michael Payne were? Because his father, I think, was a Trotskyite and or her father, Hyde. I mean, I understand that her father may have been, you know, a liberal, um, you know, do gooder working with AID. But wasn't Michael Payne's father on the FBI watch list for being an active Trotskyite back east? Yeah. George Lyman Payne was Michael Payne's father. And he, he was a very prominent Trots, Trotskyite. Um, he, he spent uh, most of his later life in Los Angeles. And he, he was, you know, leading a group of tr Trotskyites out there. Uh, so he was definitely on all kinds of watch lists. Um, mm -hmm. And from what I understand, Michael Payne and his father were, were mostly estranged. Uh, mm -hmm. But... Uh, as you hear Vince Salandria in the film, he says, you know, Michael Payne's working for Bell Helicopter and he has a secret clearance there. Um, but his dad is is a communist. You know, there must be a, a quid pro quo. Uh, he says, you know, we know, you know, Michael Payne's an agent immediately that he he would have to be. Do. Informing or giving some sort of information to the to the government to, to get a secret clearance uh, with with that kind of family history. Um, Ruth Payne's family, her her parents were. Oh, well, let me were, just interrupt for one second yeah. because wasn't Michael Payne's stepfather working at Bell Helicopter, and that's how he got the job? Yeah, Michael Payne's stepfather is Arthur Young. Arthur Young, right? He okay. Invented the really the first commercially successful helicopter, the Helica Bell, yeah. the Bell yeah. 47 right. in 1947, which is the MASH helicopter you see with the bubble. Mm -hmm. um, and so he he sort of worked, he, he, he worked with Bell helicopter and uh, later Bell went on to, to develop the, uh, the UH-1 Huey helicopter, which was used in Vietnam extensively. Right. And that's that is why Michael Payne was able to get a, a job at, at Bell Helicopter. Right. I just wanted to clear that up because there's a guy who is a senior vice president at uh, Bell named Walter Dornberger, uh, shown here. That's ostensibly his boss. <laughs> so uh, he didn't get the job through Dornberger. I don't think uh, Dornberger obviously coming over through Operation Paperclip with Werner von Braun, who sets up NASA. But. This is Dornberger um, before I think he went to Bell Helicopter, actually. Maybe. But it might have been earlier. It might have been a different job that he had. 
But yeah. was there any mention between Michael Payne and Dornberger, or the, or is, uh, they must have interacted at Bell? Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't ask Michael about that, and I right. I haven't read much about their their interaction. But, but uh, yeah, he Dornberger was uh, one of his his bosses, his supervisors at Bell. I'm sure they interacted. Uh, right, and. It didn't uh, well, again, just getting back to the politics of Michael Payne, if he's that far left or to the left and you're working for a Nazi who's come to your job in Operation Paperclip, I think this might be important. Yeah, well, I, I think it's it's very contradictory that that the Paynes uh, are supposed to be pacifists. Right. Uh, uni Unitarian or Quaker and uh, very liberal and yet Michael is working for this, this military contractor uh, making helicopters. Uh, it's, it's strange. And he continues to work there after the assassination. Oh, yeah. Now, um, what about the phone call? You did cover the phone call, I think, in your film, Max, right? Yeah, the, the boat, we both know who is responsible. Right. Yeah. Is there anything more about that you could add to the, about the phone call? Because I don't think the audience knows about that. Okay, so the, the day of the assassination, uh, Michael Payne calls his, he calls Ruth, uh, and somehow the, their conversation was being monitored. And, Which is odd. And, well, and it, let me just yeah. interject. I believe that's because of uh, Marina Oswald being a Soviet uh, citizen under the roof that they might have wiretap that phone at the uh, Payne residence is my theory, but go on. Yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, yeah. So this, this uh, report, we have this report and it's, it, it's somebody who listened in on the conversation uh, says that uh, Mike, Michael said, uh, we know Oswald is responsible or we know Oswald did it, but we both, but he's not responsible. We, we both know who is responsible. Um, and then there's, there's a, some controversy over when this phone call was made, but according to the, the records, it seems like the phone call was made, uh, at, at like a, around, uh, one to one to 2 PM or something, the day of the assassination at, at a time before Oswald was even, uh, being reported as as a suspect or having been taken into custody. Uh, that was so, my impression too. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. This this phone call is very strange. Um, Ruth Ruth admits that something along these lines happened. That she that this conversation happened, and she she says that uh, you know that they they thought it was right wing radicals who who were oh, yeah. responsible. Yeah. yeah, but she wouldn't point the finger at General Walker, who seems to be in her world orbit. view. What's that? I said orbit or whatever. I orbit, mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I would think that she would finger someone like a Walker with his ties to meetings of Alpha 66, where Michael Payne and Oswald uh, attend. I mean, it seems like it would be something that would be obvious to Ruth Payne. But she's yeah. intent. I mean, let me ask you this. The, the phone calls, the two phone calls that Oswald makes to her trying to get apt from the ACLU in New York uh, to represent him. Do you think she actually made those phone calls? Because she says repeatedly that she was appalled. And you, you get into this a little bit in the movie, that she was appalled that he was even asking her. Yeah, uh, I I don't know whether she she made the calls or not. I I. I she says that she made them. She 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 called, but the phone just rang. You know, nobody answered. So she she gave up. Uh, right. And yeah, it's it's a little strange. But she she was, you know, she said she was resentful that that Oswald was asking her for any sort of help at that point. Um, and she, she right. Does, well, the reason the reason yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. The reason I think it's odd is because this is a pacifist family that is so steeped in civil liberties and the ACLU 
and all of that uh, traditional liberal material, the fact that the guy would call up asking for representation would seem to be, even if I think he was involved, I would crawl over broken glass naked to get this guy representation. You know what I mean? Simply from my worldview, Max. Yeah. And that, you know, that kind of goes to the fact that, that Ruth admits she was sort of glad when Oswald was killed, uh, which is, is strange. She's, she's admitted this, you know, multiple times that her, her immediate reaction was sort of relief. I know that was when, weird. when Oswald was killed, that, that was weird. It would be easier for, for Marina and there wouldn't have to be a trial or something. Right. Um, and, uh, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's odd. <laughs> Um, well, what's also odd is the letters after the assassination, which I, I have here. I was just rereading them before the show. Day after day after day. When can I see you? When are we going to get together? Let's have dinner. Uh, I, I miss you. It's just unending. Every single day writing a letter to Marina, which, of course, are intercepted by the Secret Service, who tell her famously not to interact with Ruth Payne, that Ruth Payne is linked to the CIA. Uh, any comment on that? Yeah. So uh, when when Marina was was testifying for Jim Garrison, uh, they asked her about that and asked her if this the, the Secret Service ever told her not to be associated with Ruth, and she said yes. And they, you know, said was it was it the CIA? You know, was she she was associating or friendly with the CIA or something? And and Marina confirmed that uh, some people are 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 trying to debunk that point, saying mm -hmm. that Marina thought they were talking about the ACLU instead of the CIA. <laughs> so uh, it's not just they rhyme. I didn't yeah. know that. Well, there's yeah. another letter. It's another bunch of letters. Why not? You can you can look at the testimony and and yeah. decide for yourself. Uh, I don't I don't know. Uh, but you know, of course, the fact is that that Ruth is affiliated through her family members uh, with the CIA. You can you can connect her to the CIA through her her sister. I thought you did a marvelous job of that, Max. You know, indicating the sister thing. Of course, uh, again, um, she's been backed into a corner historically, repeatedly about her sister. Uh, could you talk a little bit about her sister? who was actually in the CIA phone directory for a number of years, right? Yeah. So her, her sister, Sylvia Hoke, uh, was employed uh, with the CIA and the, the researchers have done work on her. Um, we have a document that, that she was listed in uh, the Falls Church, Virginia phone directory as a CIA employee. So we have this document. We That's know she was she worked for, you know, she was had some assignment with the Air Force and uh, she was possibly, you know, undercover. Um, so she's she's confirmed as as a CIA employee, her sister uh, and her father, who worked for USAID. We know through a document that he was at least uh recruited or he was considered for use by the agency in vietnam in 1957 um and her father william avery hyde he also he, he wrote reports for for usaid he did a lot of work in latin america right um i guess setting up cooperatives uh her parents her parents were socialists uh they supported norman thomas the the mm -hmm socialist candidate for president um but also you know very patriotic and very strongly anti-communist because the communists and this is from ruth uh directly that the anti the the communists tried to sort of co-opt ruth's parents more moderate form of socialism and they tried to come into their their meetings and their groups and take over so her her parents hated the communists and uh, well just to, just so it was just to be clear here yeah 
it, it gets into a lot of international warfare among the communists, the Trotskyites, socialists, democratic liberals. I think the communist is kind of a broad statement because I think what you're referring to is a lot of internal warfare among communists. Well, yeah, it depends. You know, I, 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 I think they would, they, the people would say, you know, socialist versus communist. There's, there's a, there's a, clear difference, you know, depends, it all depends on your perspective and people well, I mean, can just, throw, just throw everybody just, into the communist leftists. It, How about just say leftists? Well, yeah. I, I mean, there was a lot of Stalinists. <laughs> there were a lot of Stalinists in America at that point who weren't happy with the Trotskyites, right, Max? Yeah. Okay, well, that's... you know, they, they killed, they killed Trotsky. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, <laughs> there's, there is a lot of, you know there are a lot of different camps and uh, in, 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 in fighting yeah. with yeah. within the left and yeah. mm -hmm. the the non-communist left as it was called is includes socialists or people you know with with sort of democratic socialist ideals uh you know welfare and universal health care and stuff like that who who might not be full-on you know soviet style communists revolutionary right. communists and and that's how i think you you could see ruth's family that they they were more on the the patriotic capitalists with with a little bit of socialist uh policies uh you know to to help out the poor and and, and stuff like that uh but it's 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 easy to see that that her family could be the kind of people who uh, would be tapped by the intelligence agencies to to inform or uh, do work against communism. That 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 would fit in with their ideals, and they would right. have contacts within the left. Well, uh, explain their connection to Alan Dulles through Bancroft or to the family and uh, Nashuan Island and that whole segment there that you in your film. I thought that was riveting. Um. Yeah. So, yeah, we're talking about Nashon Island. Mm -hmm. This is this is a private island owned by the Forbes family off of Cape Cod uh, that they they've had s since the 1800s, and they have a bunch of summer homes there. You know, the the big extended Forbes family goes on vacation there, uh, including John Kerry. Um, nice. And uh, so Michael Payne's mother was a Forbes. Her, her maiden name was Forbes, Ruth Forbes. Her, her, she was also named Ruth. <laughs> right. And uh, so one of her best friends was a woman named Mary Bancroft. And Mary Bancroft was a spy and a mistress of Alan Dulles. Um, she wrote a book called Autobiography of a Spy. Um, you can check it That's out. That's a giveaway. That's a dead giveaway. And, uh, you know, we even have some of the correspondence between Mary Bancroft and Alan Dulles it has been declassified over the years. So they they were in close contact. And uh, Bancroft and Dulles were actually invited to stay on this island. I I was never able to confirm if, they, if Dulles ever went there. Um, who knows? But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of re researchers, this this connection, like, directly from the family to Alan Dulles uh, is is the most suspicious um, but it's only only one of the family connections to the to the scene. right there are multiple it's uh, you know the tentacles of an octopus it seems like there's quite a few if you take the two of them as a couple I mean you you delicately deal with this I mean very well uh, as a filmmaker I mean you let this play out and confronting both of them with these documents, uh, that being Priscilla McMillan and Ruth Payne, seems to be the most fascinating part of the documentary for me, um, because I was surprised at the beginning. I just thought, oh, this is going down a real mainstream road when I see, you know, uh, uh, Max Holland and, and that group at the beginning. I was deceived. Uh, you really redeemed yourself by the end of the movie. Very nicely played, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, I, you know, it was important for me to uh, sort of keep people guessing and, uh, 
you know, allow for for different perspectives to have have their say. And I know uh, the audience. I want the audience to be a little bit, you know, off off their toes on their toes to 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 wonder, you know, what's what's the film trying to say? What are the the various characters trying to say? And and who do I believe? Where where do I stand? You know, it's a, I, they, they're supposed to be thinking for themselves, not not just taking in some some propaganda. Well, the editing does that. I'm I'm sure you have more footage of Jim uh, Jim Diogenio than you put into that film. Uh, I know Jim. I've worked with Oliver Stone. I yeah, I know these guys. So the Max Holland one I thought was fascinating because Max Holland says I wrote one article for the CIA and. Interestingly enough, which you didn't put in your film, was that um, Max Holland ran a website called CIA.gov. He was the curator of the website for the CIA. And that's why he probably didn't have time to write many articles. Really? I, I didn't know that. That's news yeah. to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah. uh, another one, um, Mark had brought it up and we kind of talked about it at the end of Ruth Payne. <clears throat> there were some questions about finances, like, Michael Payne really wasn't hurting for for money, at least family money. And yet they were living in a dump. And from what I understand, Ruth Payne bought three houses in the uh, neighborhood as well. After the Did you go in, after the, she bought up three homes around her in that neighborhood there where the house was. Um, yeah, the, the Paynes were were very wealthy. Michael Payne had a, a trust fund from. The Forbes family, and I, I think, you know, they had uh, three hundred thousand dollars at least, or something, in in one of these accounts, or that we know about. Um, and I, and I believe I read that the the house they were living in at the time in Irving, Texas, very small house, you know, cost about five thousand dollars at the time. Um, so they they were living very modestly. They, I think they've always lived modestly throughout their lives. Uh, I, I don't know about Michael specifically, but every Every place I've seen Ruth living is is pretty modest. I think they're you know they're on the Quaker modesty uh, kind of end of things, um, and I, I don't know anything about these other houses, um, but uh, I know I think I heard that she she moved into a larger house after the assassination. That, that is true. She also when in one of the letters she writes to Marina, she goes into the finances of Michael Payne and her to convince Marina in detail. Uh, how much he makes a year at Bell Helicopter, which was ninety six hundred dollars. He gets five hundred dollars from the Forbes thing. And and she's trying to and they're going to give her an allowance in the letter of ten dollars a week to buy baby food. She's trying to lure in Marina uh, at that time in the summer um, of 63. And she I don't know why this would be of interest to Marina, but she literally goes and breaks down. I don't know if it's honest. Uh, Michael and hers finances. I don't know if you had a chance to look at those. Uh, the letters, which are top secret, according to this stamp here. But um, it's fascinating the lengths, like I said, it's fascinating the lengths that Ruth Payne went to to get Marina to live with her, a woman she barely knows. I, I just, I can never get my mind around, uh, unless it's the Quaker thing, like you're saying, it could be the Quaker angle. Yeah, well, this this is the question. It's, it's people have always said, well, the pains are just are do-gooders, uh, and other people have said, "Well, had did they ever do stuff like this before or after?" Uh, and that's did a they? Question. Not that I know of. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, well, they had Frederick Osborne, I think, testify before the Warren Commission and his wife, and said they were religious do-gooders, right, Max? And Osborne's father, I believe, was a close friend of a guy named Alan Dulles. Uh, <laughs> That's right. right. The, the Osbournes were were sort of character witnesses for the pains. Uh, they came in to to sort of say these these people are are totally innocent, and you know, there's there's no you shouldn't have any suspicion of them. Um, and yeah, Osborne, you know, Osborne's father connected to Dulles. Uh, and a, a leading uh, eugenicist of, of his oh, time. Oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot about that. Wow. A eugenicist. That goes with Quakers. That goes with the Nazis. <laughs> wow. Well, I think it did. 
<clears throat> fantastic job. I mean, it's a subtle film. It plays out nicely. The tempo is great. The graphics are great. It looks beautiful. And I hate everything, Max. I, I really like I am a hater from way back. I've been in the film business for a long time. And um, I really love this film quite a bit. I thought it's a real piece of art. Thank you so much. I, I put a lot of effort into this thing. This is a labor of love. Uh, you know, put my own, my own money and time into it, all my spare time over the last several years. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't do this to make money. I, I did this because I, pe I think people need to know this history. And uh, I want this this story to live on, hopefully, with, with uh, younger generations, too. I think There's, people need uh, to know it about will. this. I think it definitely will. I mean, this thing's got legs and it's going to last a long time. There's a kid who lives across the street from me who made a documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car, named Chris Payne. And uh, I don't know if you got a chance to interview him, a fellow documentary maker. Uh, her um, son. I, her, I, her. I think there's some I think there's some confusion about about that. I mm -hmm. I I don't think that uh, that Chris Payne is Ruth Payne's son. Oh, interesting. Uh, because I've, I've I've seen pictures of him, um, and it's not the same person. Um, Interesting. It, yeah. Well, he cra he claimed in an, a, a bio. I thought that his family went back to the pains, uh, the Declaration of Independence pains. But I could be wrong. He could, could be, be he could be another wing of the same pain family. Right. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But I, I if if you want to confirm that, you can ask him. But I'm, I'm you know, ninety nine percent sure it's not the okay. same person. All right. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll definitely ask him then. Now, what did you? What is your biggest regret about the film that you couldn't get? A guy you wanted to get, an angle you wanted to put in, or film footage you couldn't afford? Yeah. Well, I was lucky enough to get get fair use on all my archival footage. I had, Ooh. A, had Ooh. A, an amazing fair use lawyer, uh, Peter Yazzie at uh, American University, one of the leading, leading experts. University, or yeah, he's a he's, he's one of the leading experts on fair use and uh, wow. copyright internet, intellectual property law. Um, so if I hadn't got that, this film would have been impossible. I, I wouldn't have been able to afford to make it. Um, you know, you got to pay like $30 a second, $60 right. a second for some of this archival footage. Shocking um, how much archival footage you've packed in there. Yeah, I looked That's at That's why everything. I'm asking you because it's so shocking that, that, you were able to get such great stuff and also the the, the trial you know the mock trial uh with Bugliosi and 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 spence is great yeah um trying to think of somebody who i, I wish i could have could have interviewed i mean there there was a somebody who who knew ruth in nicaragua who i was trying ah, to get i was really trying to get to that person but they never responded um it would have been great to get Thomas Mallon, the guy who wrote the, oh, the book garage. about Ruth Payne, who's a uh, official story uh, defender, um, right. and mm. he, you know he would have been a good voice defending Ruth, also. Well, tell us about your attempt to get Marina Oswald because that's in the film. Yeah, I tried. I I sent her a letter, tried to get you know message to her through through some people in Dallas who knew her. I I called her. Eventually I, you know, I was able to reach her. She she answered the phone and I was shocked. Wow. Like <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, yeah, I'm I'm talking to Marina Oswald out of the blue. <laughs> uh and she was extremely nice and you know very helpful, but she was clear that she she didn't want to do an interview. Um and yeah, she she told me not to waste my life on this. <laughs> it's, it's it was an interesting battle. comment. Yeah, don't go, yeah. don't waste your life on this. I don't think you're going to, but I mean, you've put in X amount of time into this. I'm sure you have other ideas. Uh, are you done with the genre now or? I don't know. We'll see where this goes. Uh, I, I don't have the, the energy or the money to, to do this over again. I, I'll have to, you know, have more, more partners, more funding to, uh, to do something like this again to take on another subject in this area you mean yeah. not 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 ruth Payne. you're talking about yeah. something else. Yeah. yeah well you clearly know a lot about it max i mean you, your your research is impeccable you seem to have read all the right books i mean um other than uh ruth Payne's garage where there's really nothing in that book but 
um, you know, JFK and the Unspeakable, you know, marvelous book. It gets you into the genre, I presume, from what you said. Yeah, that's that's one of the first yeah, books that I read. Yeah. And right. did you read uh, David Talbot's book about uh, the <laughs> brothers and Devil's Chessboard, I presume? And Yeah, I read I read both those books. I've read some of Jim De Eugenio's books. Um, Destiny Betrayed. Jim Garrison's books. Uh, you know, I, I did read uh, Jail Posner and Priscilla Mac McMillan. Um, and yeah, uh, well, Yossi's reclaiming history, I guess. Uh, I, I never, I didn't read that one, but, um, Martin Schott's book. Have you ever read history will not, not absolve us? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There, there's, okay. That's another good one. Have you read mortal era about the secret service agent who stands up and blows JFK's head off in the motorcade? My favorite uh, uh, crazy theory book of all time is Mortal Era, written by an Australian cop who says um, uh, George Hickey, the Secret Service agent, has an accidental discharge of his AK-47. Yeah, I, I or AR-15 rather. Uh, yeah, I know there's a lot of a lot of crazy theories out there, a lot of disinformation, um, and I think you know it's really important to be factual when you're talking about this stuff and and to rely on good sources. And, and be willing to, uh, you know, take take something back if you happen to, you know, hear something that ends up being wrong, you know. Well, uh, well, did you have a background in journalism? I mean, where did you get this addiction to facts? I mean, where does that come from? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I went to school for communications and then for documentary film. Uh, never, I was never really involved with you know, sort of mainstream journalism, but I was been involved with, uh, you know, political activism and mm -hmm. research, uh, historical research. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think, uh, you know, all this stuff, people try to pretend that all this hidden history, all this alternative research is just made up out of thin air. It's, it's uh, there's nothing to it, you know, and you should just ignore it. These are wacky conspiracy theorists. And when you start looking into it, it's not true. Uh, a there's of, a, lot of, a lot of a lot of meat on lot, that bone, huh? Yes, there's a lot of meat there. There's a reason there have been, you know, like a, thousands of books written on the JFK assassination. There's a reason there's five million pages of documents, uh, you know, at at the National Archives. And uh, I think that. This history is is uh, is not not settled for you know in in the wider wider culture yet and and uh, maybe we need to revisit it and uh, finally decide what the truth is. Right on. Awesome right on. Point. Um, good point. To pay some bills, we've had some influence here. Sparty Matt saying um, he watched Destiny Betrayed on our recommendation. Now he's looking forward to watching um, your documentary on the next. Yeah, uh, a lot of people are well. taking the recommendation, Max, and watching it. I was surprised on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, the people responding to my uh, plea there to watch it. Um, very interesting uh, uh, follow up to people watching your, your work. Yeah, I think this is this is sort of a unique project on the assassination because it's it's personalized through the story of Ruth Payne. It's not just about the assassination in general, right. you know. You right. got this this sort of true crime angle into the assassination, and uh, I, my hope was always that 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 was going to bring in a, a wider audience and people who who weren't already obsessed with all this all these details and all this history. You know, they might say this this is intriguing. What some people think this this woman is lying that she's holding secrets to the JFK assassination. Uh, you know, I'd I'd like to see what that's all about. Um, right on. Right so I, I hope I hope this movie has has a life and uh, the only the only way it's ever going to get out there is is word of mouth and and people like you, thankfully, uh, spreading the word. Well, I, lo I love the film and, uh, you know, I'm, I've been telling everybody to take a look at it. Um, and and what I'd like to do is is let Max go and then you and I, Eric, can wrap up. We don't, we don't have to drag okay. Max into our business, but. I mean, just I just wanted to interview you and help promote the film. 
get your side of it and let the people who follow us see the guy who made the film and how great it is. They can watch it themselves. I strongly recommend it. I give it uh, two bullets up. <laughs> my, I guess my, <laughs> my highest rating in the, the Kennedy genre now. But uh, Max, just great work. Fantastic film. I uh, would love to talk to you afterwards at some point about some future projects if you're interested. Uh, there might be something of interest to you, um, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that later um, off air. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having right. me. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Okay, so now we, you and I, can do what we got to do without dragging him involved into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. You know, we, we, we do uh, need to pay the bills, boss. Right. What's this? Hey, Mark, <clears throat> you were doing a show. On, I read it was great. Hey, Mark, you were going. Yeah, we're still going to do it. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. Answer yeah. the question. Wait a second. Uh, Wait a second. What? This just came in the mail because of the PayPal book fund. Ah. This just arrived in the mail because of the PayPal people. No, this well, is there where it goes, my friends, to books yeah. on Mary Meyer. All right. Well, people want Dorothy. Where's your book on Dorothy? Oh, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That guy's a fraud. That oh, one and 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 uh, um, what's her name? The girlfriend of Oswald. Uh, um, that's not going to happen. That crazy. All girl. right. Um, Tarkina Meyer. So glad to caught us live. Now, is this someone who's in uh, Tasmania? No, no, no. No, no, in Texas. Okay. This is one who's in. in a te native Texan. There's one who's in Tasmania who's separate. who's from Texas, but yeah, I'm not okay. sure where she was originally from or how she ended up in Tasmania. But the um... awesome, and then Georgina. Wow, well, uh, well, talk about consistent, lovely, lovely Georgina. Thank Scary you. How corrupt the government. So very glad that there are people out there willing to dig in. Yeah, this guy apparently dedicated his life to it. Max, good, fantastic. Yeah, he did. I mean, my God. Quiet guy, but uh, very forceful in the filmmaking. Very nicely played. Uh, um, I do love the USA, but I want the truth. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's absolutely true. Super sticker from Lady Freddy. Lady Freddy on the board. Very nice. And uh, by the way, everybody, thank you so much for being tolerant. We wanted to really do an interview and not interrupt and have the flow disrupted. So right. thank you for waiting for us to you know, do this at the end. It, it does help a, a great deal. I don't, I don't have enough on Rose Jeremy to do a full episode on her. And my thoughts on Bouvier having shot Jack, that's, uh, I don't know enough enough about that one either. But uh, what are your thoughts? Fred Hampton, uh, I didn't think it was an assassination. I thought it was a shootout. He had a gun. He fired multiple shots, went back and forth. If he didn't have a gun, uh, might be a different story. Mark Beyond, Eason, thank Mark, you. 40, oh, 4999. Wow. Wow. Freaking wow. awesome. Wow. These people love this stuff, Eric. Which is great. And if you want to, um, you know, show your friends how much you love your stuff, this stuff, we have merch below. You can get a, a polo, uh, caps. I just got the sweatshirt in the mail Oswald today. the dog. I got the hoodie, Eric, and two hats and a shirt today. Oh, cool. Yeah, I dropped some money. Um, I don't know where what? it goes. probably goes into the Hunley College Fund. But the the hoodie I it's tried on the Oswald perfect. College Fund. We're gonna send Oswald. The dog's name is Oswald. The dog's That's Oswald. Right. That's a good name for that dog. <laughs> yeah. Well, the audience named him. I mean, the chat named him. I, it's like, oh, yep, Oswald. That's it. Don't forget the free Minox with every ten thousand subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Don't say that. People are like, am I number ten thousand? Oh, wait on. Nineteen ninety nine just found us. Nice Imagine cigar. people just stumbling onto this channel going, what the hell is going on here? No kidding. No kidding. I mean, I, I would be glued to this thing if I were them. You know what I mean? Like, look how all of a sudden, where's the subscriber sign that we used to have, Eric? Remember the sign you used to put up, subscribe? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on. And yeah. then you had the ticker tape parade on the bottom. That was great. There, I like that. That's my favorite thing now. Unstructured. <laughs> dot, it looks like something out of Times Square. I love this. And then the red sign. There it is. Remember to subscribe. Push that button. We should have done it at the beginning, but we had that. No, yeah. we were trying to get rolling yeah. into the interview, get him. Both Eric and I hate doing this, by the way. We're, we really do. But we have no choice because <laughs> we're up against 10 million pussycat videos. Yes. And there's nothing we can do about it other than to toot this subscribe and content horn, which 
to be honest with you, it's a pain in the ass, but I guess we have to do it until we get larger numbers up on the uh, scoreboard. Yeah, and if they keep suppressing the videos, it doesn't help. Um, right. Uh, well, we had one that was, what was it, a few days ago from April that finally got cleared for monetization. And keep in mind, it's not just the money because, okay, yes, we want the money, da, da, da. But if YouTube can't run ads against it or they determine they're not running ads against it, right. well, then they suppress it and it doesn't right. go anywhere right. because they want to make money. Then so we get that. Of, sometimes we get the Encyclopedia Britannica label on top. Oh, we of get it. that. That's like so an honor. That's a badge of honor. I don't mind getting that one. You know what I mean? Yeah, we definitely but we, love that. I mean, we need the subscribers to drive the train to get people like who Max. Are named, what's that? Like Max. Like Max. Who I mean, Max was on. nice enough to come on. I mean, yeah. You know, we don't really have huge numbers, but we, to get other people on, we need bigger numbers, more subscribers more PayPal for me to get their books and their movies. And I can't say the word PayPal enough, but the reality <laughs> of it is, <laughs> I mean, we have a good time, Eric and I, I love doing this with them. So it does, we would do this for nothing anyway. We're basically doing it for nothing, but it seems to have generated and sparked a lot of people, including Barnes and Viva who came on last week. You know, Barnes gave us a great shout out on his show. Two uh, of them on Sunday. Two? I didn't know there Two was shout outs. One. Yeah, no, he did later. He said it was the the most fun of the past week. Wow. Uh, and that's by the way, that's good company. Because wow. he was Barnes, on Ricardo. Hey, Barnes was on every single YouTube I know. show ever made. And we won. We were the oh, fun dude. one. <laughs> he called, what do they call us? The magical quartet or something? Uh, but that was the first shout out. And then the second one he was saying, but the most fun I had was on the um uh, on this show. And this is after Ricada. And the Duran and geez, wow. I mean everybody. Yeah, so. Harris and uh, yeah, every and Viva, Viva had a good time too. He's a good sport. Oh, He's David's always sport. fun. He's a good sport to take all the abuse from us. <laughs> it's very good natured abuse, but yeah, I hope to have them back. I hope to go on their show, um, Eric and I, and and have Barnes. We still got Free Form Friday coming up, I guess, yep. ne next month with Barnes by himself, unless Viva. Uh, drives his car into the show and gets out of the car and you know does his thing with no his, one we'll make him sit in the car and maybe make him sit to a vlog in the car or he could be ice fishing. I mean, this guy is going to have such a change in temperature. You talk about frizzy hair. You, you think he's got frizzy hair in Canada? Wait till he hangs out with those uh, members of the tribe in Boca Raton for a couple of months. <laughs> when you see his hair, then in that humidity down in Florida. Look at these super Catherine stickers. Astronaut. Thank you. And thank Fifth you. Gear gave us one too. You know, we had one of those uh, thank yous on the thank comment you, section last week. Oh, we, and we just got one. Just got one right before the show. I saw it. Uh, a super thanks. That was awesome. Oh, super thanks before the show. That's great. We're getting them before the show now. That's absolutely. Oh well, yes, we had no. We had a super chat before the show, but we had a super thanks as well. I, okay. I just saw it in the uh, in, in the comments. Well, these, that kind of inspires me. I'm, all this stuff. It's not just the money. It's really the fact that people are. The response is what really drives Passionate. me. Passionate. Yeah, because I've been doing this myself, you know, for 25 years. <laughs> Nobody ever cared what I was doing. I mean, Oliver Stone cared. And uh, Frame Green. 313, good documentary. Check it out. I don't think the war I don't think the uh, Zapruder film was altered substantially. Life magazine altered the frames in print. Uh, uh, and that altered the storyline, by the way, um, of the story by reversing the frames. And that was intentional. Um, by a reporter from Life magazine early on. But the film itself, um, which is shown in 1975 by, by um, Geraldo Rivera on his show, is originally shown in the courtroom only of the uh, Garrison trial with Shaw, which we covered in the Clay Shaw thing. Um, but we're going to do Jim Garrison as a standalone separate episode, Eric, right? Yeah, uh, soon. We were going to do it today, but I think it's been... Right, you know, push because of Max, and then uh, we we have to do the Elliot Smith part two because the clamor for this is getting louder. Yeah, louder. people are kind of saying, "Hey, you were going to do that? What's going on?" And they've got to just got to go over the coroner's report and 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 go through the whole thing. And hey, Gypsy, Gypsy Moon has a, a good point. It, it actually makes me think of something. Um, I've heard of dark journalists, and I've heard of a lot of other channels. I don't necessarily have contact with them, however, but you guys all can help. So if you're watching these channels and you're commenting, they're saying, hey, you need to you know, check out America's Untold Stories or you need to get these guys on your show. 
creators do take notice of that over time. They're like, well, who the hell are these guys? And I never heard of these guys. Are they are they some? Uh, uh, I, I've I, I've heard of dark journalists. I think it's a pretty popular YouTuber. But all I'm saying is that we don't know all of them. You know, if you're part of their audience, that recommendation does have influence. I yeah, do remember when the salty request. cracker people showed up when we had Barnes on. Sure. All those salty cracker army showed up. That was kind of nice. Right. We were and, talking about Gamergate and stuff like that. Right. But you guys have the power. You can help us get the word out better than anyone. I mean, let me see. Spuddy yeah. Matt, thank you very Spuddy. much. You Spuddy. like it smaller, but not too small. OK, <laughs> can we can we compromise, Sparty? <laughs> By the way, comment below, because Eric and I do respond to the comments in the comment section after the show or during the week. I mean, we're getting comments now from episodes we did a year ago, and we still respond to those comments as people now finding the channel going back and looking at older episodes. So here, here's the super things on the, one of the older uh, videos I watched. Okay. Yeah. I found your, right. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, you could leave a comment and if we find it, I mean, we have the notifications, but sometimes I just stumble onto these things and I try, yeah, we try, we try to, it, some it, of them it, I don't it, even remember. We some don't guy, answer every one of them. We just no. flat out can't. Uh, Mark is better than I am on this channel. Okay. If it sounds snarky or funny, it's Mark. Yeah, I try to put my issues so Eric doesn't get blamed. He forgets I, all the time. I, I think I write I write in the voice I speak, or at least my agent. Yeah, you, you'll know. Yeah, my agents have always said you write like you speak, which is always a great compliment for a writer because you really want to just write in your own voice. And, so, and you mean, see something that says, you know, jump off a bridge, it's probably Mark. Well, that's a little over the top. I, I think I could be a little bit more subtle than that, Huntley. You know, jump off a bridge. Or I could be harsher than that. Well, I, mean, I wasn't. I wasn't going to swear. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. How do you get around the pinkos blocking the fruit? I, look, I barely leave my house. I mean, you have to. For us to go out now, and all my friends, nobody wants to go out. Everything is at home. You get. I get everything delivered. I never leave. That's how I get around it. Uh, that's I'm good advice. Fans to want your stuff more than beer. There could be. Oh, that's interesting. Good. Good point. That's interesting. Yeah, we, we keep Thank hearing you. about that swag cup. I, I know that people would would definitely dig on that. <laughs> that 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 one is customized. We should have an auction. <laughs> the sticker cup. Yeah, I just drew a sticker on there that Unley sent me. But like I did get a couple of hats today, a t-shirt, and the and the hoodie. The hoodie's great. Awesome. The hoodie I tried on, right? It's a little tight, but I got, you know, I'll get into it. I got a yeah. large. I could have gotten an extra large, but I'll live with it. Well, I definitely wouldn't fit a large right now. Right. But. It's hard to tell with the size. The, the large T-shirt fits perfectly. And I gave some swag to Thomas Jane, the actor, this weekend. And he's wearing it now. For, that means and I gave him a bunch of pins and stickers and probably end up with his daughter putting them on her high school wall or something. But Hey, uh, stickers on your books, right? No. Stickers <laughs> on your books. Right. All right. That's where it's going to end up. But uh, we'll I, I'm sure that the kids will love us. <laughs> It's we're good. known for that. All right, folks. So don't know what we're doing on Friday. Probably maybe Elliot Smith. Maybe we'll do Elliot maybe Smith we'll this Friday. Yeah, take it off and, the board. And then we'll we got to do the Lindbergh baby kidnapping next week. And um also we'll, we'll do Garrison next week. Garrison and then the Lindbergh baby Perfect. kidnapping. I think. That'd be uh, good. Happy Friday. Great story. That's a fantastic American story involving German Americans of all things. So if you're a German American. Uh, whoever you are out there, this might be a good story for you. Or if you're from New Jersey, it might be a good story for you where the crime happens. Or someone who's just into kidnapping and American true crime. So on that note. Yeah, we're not all JFK. Remember that. Uh, no, and we're definitely not Alex Baldwin. So right, we'll see right. you on Friday. Right. Thanks for the paper. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>